Um, but this, one of the essential things for us was that this basically came down with almost no notice. I mean, ever, of course, everybody knew what a, what a um, difficult time everyone was having with COVID-19. And yet uh, it was, we were preparing for, I wanted, I'm pretty sure it was the third Sunday of Lent, um, early in March, we were preparing for that Sunday. And I think it was Friday when we got this shelter in place order. So we literally had nothing in the church that Sunday. We, we, there was no way to prepare anything in that much time. Um, so if you want to talk about expectations, I think all of us, I, I should say, that's probably way too general, but almost all of us um, expect to worship together on Sunday in some way. And that was literally not possible uh, for, for us on the, what was the third Sunday of Lent, which not only is a is an important day in the whole you know, 90 days of Easter, but it, it's one of the days where we celebrate uh, an important rite of, the Chris, of Christian initiation, which is you know, the first scrutiny. Um, so it was, a, it was a huge loss for us. It turned out that you know, really the whole, all of those who've been involved in Christian initiation and during that time was a huge loss for all of them too. So yes, we had to sort of realign those expectations, but I think the big one was just really, you know, how can we try to stay together as a community, which is ident which self-identifies as a praying community and as an active community, all of our, you know, sort of what we call apostolic works or charitable works also ground to a halt. So, you know, how are we able to maintain our identity in that kind of environment? So I don't want to overstay my welcome, so I'll just stop for a second and however long and, and let um, Tim speak. Thanks, Rory. I think, uh, I think we went virtual the same week that you're talking about, the third week of Lent, um, and we realized that we had to do it on Wednesday. Uh, and it was really scary, and I was very grateful for, um, for Brian because Brian actually knew what he's doing online, as you can tell. Um, but, you know, I'm struck by... The fact that I feel like when people come to church, they are looking for a place that's going to be familiar and comfortable for them, but they're also hoping that they will leave changed. And so there is this tension between wanting it to be familiar and wanting it to change you. Um, and I always feel like when we're planning a worship service, we're trying to land somewhere in between. And we even use this, um, you know, orientation, disorientation, reorientation mindset, you know, where people recognize where they show up and then they feel uncomfortable and then they sort of discover a new way forward or a new way to orient themselves. Um, so I feel like we've been doing that in a much more dramatic way um, over the last three months. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember thinking that we might be able to come back for Easter and really hold on. <laughs> holding on to Easter as like, you know, how wonderful it would be when we come back for the first time on Easter Sunday and we get to greet each other in person. And then it was, how wonderful will it be when we celebrate Easter on Pentecost? And to celebrate Easter on the last day of Eastertide instead of the first day of Eastertide seems really appropriate. And then it was, you know, maybe by the summertime, and I think we're finally, we're, we're still trying to let go of our expectations. We're still getting out of bed in the morning by promising ourselves that things will be different by the nighttime. And, uh, you know, I think one of the really hard things here has been settling into the actual reality of what is and, um, and, and letting people ease into that at, their, at a pace that they can handle, you know? So I think as we've put together the online service, we've tried to make it look enough like the service that people would have recognized that they don't feel lost, but um, hopefully we're not just doing a bad impersonation of what was before. You know, hopefully we're able to, um, to be present to what is, and that to me is the, is the challenge is finding that sweet spot in between. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll say one thing and then, and then we'll go to breakout rooms. And so your, your prompt folks is just to keep this conversation going or surrounding expectations. Um, how were those expectations met or changed or, uh, or how are you still struggling through that? Uh, Tim, I, I agree that it's, it wasn't only a big shock at the beginning, but it's been like an ongoing process of having to, reset or, or alter expectations. Um, one of the big ones for me personally as a church musician, um, and I imagine 
in, in, in a liturgical role, even if it's not musical or in a pastoral role, um, it's the same. I was really struggling with performing the liturgy and leading without any feedback. And it felt so wrong to me. And, and it, was, it was draining me. And I was feeling like it wasn't good. Um, and I had to reset my own expectations um, to understand that I'm not going to get live feedback. Like people, I'm not gonna be able to hear people's voices and be like, oh, they got that melody like I normally do. And so I, I had to reset my own expectations about what I was doing and how I should um, be feeling uh, when leading digitally. And that was a tough transition. Can I, can I just piggyback on that and it. say, you know, <clears throat> Uh, for in in most denominations, I would say uh, you have a long tradition of that, and so I'm sure that as much for your congregation as for you, it was weird not being in a place where other people were joining in singing together as part of the celebration. For me, I've spent virtually all my adult life <clears throat> trying to uh, boss people around into singing because we have zero tradition <laughs> in our church of communal, well, I shouldn't say zero, that's terrible, but largely we don't have any tradition dating back more than about 40 or 50 years to you know, communal singing by the congregation. So all, all of our lives, we've been pushing towards that. And all of a sudden, you know, not, not all of a sudden they're not there. And now all of a sudden to continue this kind of uh, re reimagining not on, now we can finally get back together, but there's an order that we not sing. You know, the first of all, you're wearing the mask, and second of all, no singing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that that is a very strange uh, bit of uh, new information and new uh, behavior that we have to learn to cope with. All right, so we're going to breakout rooms. So keep this conversation going and share with your experiences. There will probably be about eight people per breakout room. So hopefully that's enough time for each person to, to share a little bit. Uh, and we are gonna stay in the same breakout rooms every time. So if you get cut off, uh, or if you wanna do a little bit of just introductory context in this first meeting, that's okay. Cause you're, when we reconvene, you'll have the same people in your room the next time. So see you in about 12 to 15 minutes. Well, welcome back to the main session, y'all. Um, let's go straight into the second question. Very much related. You may have already started talking about this, but I'd like us to share some stories of failure. Yes, failure. I'm a big fan of the idea that failure is not only inevitable, but it's a vital part of the learning and growth process. So how have you or your congregations failed lately and what did you learn from that so tim and rory uh let's see rory you went first last time so tim why don't you go first this time okay um i i love this question because i i have a little bit of an improv comedy background and so we talk about failure a lot from an improv point of view um you know i think to me the biggest question after any given worship service is did anything happen you know did anything happen in the last 60 minutes that was surprising um, or unplanned or authentic. And unfortunately, I think it's, it's sometimes notable <laughs> when the answer is yes. And so um, to me, there's an opportunity, you know, and the question is like, what happens when something goes wrong? You know, it obviously depends on what it is, um, but is, have you created a culture where people get nervous or have you created a culture where people laugh about it? And uh, I've tried really hard to lean towards the laughter. Um, you know, sometimes things are not funny <laughs> when they go wrong, and that's fine. But, um, you know, I've tried, to, I've tried to create a culture where we laugh at ourselves. Um, you know, there's lots of good reasons why people decide to pre-record their worship versus to do it live. Um, we've decided to do it live um, in that, partly in that improv spirit, partly because we, 
we want to we want to be together in real time and so we've opened ourselves up to all kinds of scary failures you know our church hasn't been zoom bombed but we live in fear of that reality um and both brian and i have been kicked out of worship while leading worship which is one of those things that people you know are scared of it's not happened to me during a sermon thank god um but but uh, I did get kicked out of the worship service on Easter Sunday, um, and you know I was the only one not in the service, and that didn't feel good. Uh, and then there was a Sunday when Brian got kicked out while in the middle he was like on verse two of a hymn, um, and we finished the hymn a cappella because our organist had disappeared. Um, so you know I, I like to think that the greater good coming out of those moments was that the congregation was reminded that you can bring your imperfect self to worship you know because that's what we say but then if we uh don't model it then we're not um i guess we're saying two things if we don't model it um but having been having said that i don't think anybody ever fails on purpose uh so <laughs> it's more about i guess embracing a certain amount of risk uh, i'll stop there i wanted to talk to you guys about the easter egg hunt from last year and the rats but i'm gonna i'm gonna save that in the interest of of time. <laughs> That's a good story, though. <laughs> All right, Rory, what about you? Well, also save it in case some of us just ate lunch and it, and it might not be savory. <clears throat> um, well, again, I, I'll just kind of go back to uh, the whole business of, you know, ha scripting things out in advance. I'll, I'll just, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, let me start with this. Our parish, what we've been doing is not live. We do the, um, we actually, uh, on Wednesday, we get together and uh, do and and uh, celebrate mass in the church, and then that is uh, videoed, and then we screen that over the weekend on um, on our parish website. Um, the reason for that, the ma the main re there's a couple of reasons for it. I think that first of all, what I've seen so far it makes me want to hire like six people that were in my group already, and I, or I wish. I could go work for them or something. Courtney, don't tell anybody I said that. But because it's a really exciting, people do such really exciting and creative things. But, um, but you know, so what we do, we, our church, like I said, seats 1,400. And so seven of us go in there on Wednesday afternoon. Um, the, the, pre, the three priests trying to have, you know, be present to everybody can celebrate every one of these liturgies. Um, I play... Um, and another a cantor sings it has been my wife about half the time but uh, we started trying to get more of our other cantors to sing as we all get more comfortable with the situation um, maybe you've all thought this through but you know I guess the thing that came to us in terms of failure would be if any of us was COVID positive then would shut down all of us for two weeks you know in other words that the cameraman included, and we just have one. So, um, so that's why we use three cameras, but he sets them up in advance and then he's able to piece the thing together. Um, so the way that I've been, you know, I thought about this failure thing, um, there's not too many opportunities to screw up too badly, but one of them happens to be microphones, <laughs> as, you, as you already brought up. And so, um, you know, rarely we have issues with them. And of course, the first time we had issues with them during the pandemic time when we're doing these, uh, you know, video masses happened to be also the first time that we were using a canter other than my wife, who is pretty good at rolling with stuff. And, you know, so actually we had to restart a couple of things a couple of times. And, uh, and so that basically though, I think what that said to us was, you know, check everything beforehand and afterwards. And, but we have enough, we screw up enough when we're not taping that nobody really cares that much. But for me, I mean, the essential thing uh, about failure is, I guess it would be if people don't notice somehow that this isn't mass or that this isn't a celebration of the Eucharist, if, if or, or is it, and we're not making enough, making it possible for them to enter into it more fully, you know? I, I, this is probably a theological question. It's certainly one I don't know the answer to, but I, I guess I'm sort of feeling like, uh, 
the Eucharist pretty much started in home churches. I don't see what the issue is really about, uh, I don't want to say, like going forward into that again somehow, you know, even if we're doing it virtually, you know, how, why isn't it possible for us to, you know, imagine that we sh could invite people within the context of their homes to, you know, use uh, Eucharistic elements and, you know, with the intention of the church, bring all of that to the, you know, make that everybody's homes and the altar, the Eucharistic table. I think that we wish that would happen and maybe we're kind of going through some of the motions in a way that, um, that makes us, makes it somewhat visible that we wish that, but nobody will say it explicitly for fear of, you know, the inquisition or something. So I don't want to like make too much of that. It's just that, it's just that I, I would like to, um, I would like to have people feel that as inauthentic as it can feel to watch a religious service on the internet or on your television, I wish that that um, artificiality could be somehow ameliorated by uh, inviting people into the actual eating and drinking, which is essential to the Eucharist. I guess that's sort of how I, how I wish that would happen. Maybe some of you are doing that in your places. Well, that's, that's, that's really, a, I think, that's really interesting, Roy, that you brought up the Eucharist. Um, and, and Tim, you, you kind of started off by talking about um, just being able to laugh at ourselves. And um, it, it seems like, you know, depending on what our priorities are um, and how seriously we take certain things, the risk of a failure goes way up. And then, and, and each community, each denomination, but each individual congregation is having to make choices about how high of a, of a risk threshold are we willing to take? Um, and for some that's gonna be lower. And so I think those communities tend towards more pre-recorded content. For some it's gonna be higher. Um, and then when you get into a situation like Roman Catholics and the Eucharist, um, th that seems to be the very top of the risk threshold. Like, what if we get the Eucharist wrong, right? It's like, you know. Um, so I, that, that seems to be kind of a, a threshold that people are having to answer for the first time, at least in a while. Um, and we're being forced into making these decisions. So I'm gonna break us back out into the same rooms and keep this conversation going. Share some failures. Don't be afraid to, uh, to talk about how you fail, but then but remind yourselves that these are learning opportunities. Here we go. We're back. Uh, I hope your second round of conversations were fruitful, interesting. I hope there weren't too many tears shed, or maybe they needed to be shed, who knows? Question number three for Tim and Rory to pontificate on and then for us all to continue the conversation. So finally, because this is the last question that we'll all talk about, I wanna talk about best practices for digital worship. With such an ecumenical group um, uh, that we have gathered here, that is also geographically spread across the US and Canada and beyond, what are some best practices or maybe some guiding thoughts that have emerged that seem to hold true across a variety of worship styles? Rory, I think it's your turn to go first. <laughs> Dang it, I knew that would happen. <laughs> um, best practice, okay. So I don't know what the best practices are, but I have two ideas. Uh, one of, somebody actually mentioned this in, our, in one of our conversations, and it's something that uh, has been part of, you know, my conversation with the folks here at St. Anne, which is that I think what we've discovered is that as much as we long for uh, actually getting together as a community again, as much as we long for that, we, we feel that what's been accomplished through 
uh, the virtual presence, we probably need to continue. I mean, even if all disease were to go away, there are still people who can't get to the assembly who would like to be part of what's going on. Maybe we didn't pay enough attention to that uh, up until now, but now we have an opportunity at least to, um, to continue this kind of outreach, whether it's on the, you know, the television or the internet, to local community members and others, as someone brought up, uh, you know, say alumni or, or former members who've, who now live in other states, but a way of connecting people to this, uh, to a place that they've been connected to because of sacraments and so forth. So I think continuing that, and then um, another, another small thing that we did, like we did not have daily mass during this period, but it, within the community, our priests and some of our staff members have been doing daily, like a five to 10, five to 15 minute uh, meditation on the gospel of the day, however they wanna shape it. And so that happened in the morning at the time of daily mass. I think again, for people who would like to have daily mass or some daily kind of prayer service with others and can't make it, this is a really good way of reaching out to people. And because we were kind of forced into uh, offering this, now we know how to do it and we don't feel as klutzy, you know, trying to do it going forward. Um, and I guess the only other thing that I would say is that what we found out is, um, is that I think we should do the, if we're going to do online, if we're going to do live streaming or video, we should the best possible people doing that technological business that we can find. Um, especially if you don't have the kind of church where you can like fit everybody into, you know, a, 200 square foot area of sanctuary if you've got a thing that's all spread out i think but the, the the more complicated it is to do video the more important it is to have somebody who knows what they're doing and who can consistently and well get it out on um social media i think that would be the that would be another takeaway for me Uh, so I'm scared about trying to talk to so many different contexts because I know that probably the most important thing is to like think about your actual context and what works there. Uh, but I, uh, I am thinking about Hamilton, watching the television performance of Hamilton. Um, you know, one of the biggest advantages of that was being able to get so close to the performers. You know, there's this incredible experience of being in the room where it happens, but then you have to sit, if you're me, <laughs> if you're there at all, you're in the back. Um, and when we were setting up our first online worship service, I think there was an instinct to try to recreate the point of view of a person in the pew. And that puts them far away from you. And you have the opportunity to be so much closer. Um, and I think there's an opportunity, ironically, for intimacy in the online setting that is hard to recreate in a physical space. And so one of my... Um, my best practices is to take full advantage of the intimacy and, and closeness that's possible in this format. Um, another best practice is what happens online is real life. This is not, not real life. And the relationships that we have with people online should be treated as just as real as the relationships that we have with people that we've met in the flesh. Um, we now have a group of people at Live Street that we have ne I have never met them. Um, and I've never met them in person. Um, and yet they are in worship with us every week. They are contributing financially to the church. Um, some of them don't live in Baltimore. So we're having to think about what it means potentially to have non-geographic members of our worshiping community, which is uh, amazing and awesome. Um, at this point, about 20% of the people in our worship service don't live in Baltimore City uh, and will never be coming. And so whether or not they stay with us and, you know, in the future is an open question, but I, it's been a challenge to me to think of those people as just as real and important members of our community as, as anyone else. Um, and then um, I think the third best practice is just to be honest about what we can't control. Um, I would love to think that no one who is participating is got other tabs open, is scrolling Facebook, is going to the bathroom or the kitchen when they turn their camera off. Um, 
But I think we just have to acknowledge that we can't control that. <laughs> um, and in a way, it's a relief to accept that. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, <laughs> doing the best we can with what we can control and then being honest about what we can is my third best practice. Um, I'll offer a few uh, music specific thoughts. Um, what I found is um, <clears throat> really relying heavily on, on the favorites or the familiar, um, if, if you have that. I mean, certain congregations or if you're new to a congregation, that can be hard to, to pin down. But if, if you have hymns and songs or repertoire that, that people know, um, now is the time to dig into that. And don't be afraid to repeat things. Um, the second thing is uh, to, to train whoever's doing stuff to look at the camera, which is hard. It's, it's just hard to do because the camera is not a person. And um, it's hard to, <laughs> it's just hard to do it. Um, but you have to train people and, and tell people uh, that that is the case. The best way to come across the camera is to look at the camera. Um, I think our actor, our film actor friends uh, and people who have experiences like that um, in those fields uh, have a lot to teach us. Internet connection, Wi-Fi like wireless internet connections are not designed for streaming. If you are connected through Wi-Fi, you are going to have less resolution and more spotty service. Um, the time that I got kicked off when I was leading him, I was connected on my Wi-Fi router. And for everything else, for email and stuff, or even watching a YouTube video, because it can, it can queue up ahead of time, no big deal. But when you're streaming live, a little blip can really create problems. So a hardwired internet connection makes a huge difference. Um, I drilled holes in my house and ran a line to my office so that it wouldn't happen again. And it hasn't, it hasn't happened again. Uh, so a hardwired connection is a best practice. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is to spend money or time or both, depending on what you have, as much as you can on learning about and getting the best technology you can. Meaning, research your microphones. Which microphones work best? Research your keyboard. Is it better to have a direct input with a mixer? Is it better to use a USB plug-in mic? Um, do your research on what works best for your context and your setup. Um, it is well worth the time and effort. Uh, to do those things and to experiment with it until you have it right, uh, because it makes a difference on the user's end. Um, so those are my best practices I wanted to share. So here we go. This is our last breakout session for the day. Uh, so we'll break you out. And then uh, when we come back, um, we'll ask you all to, uh, to email your ideas to uh, Stephen at the uh, So if, you, if you're jotting down ideas or anything like that, be ready to, to send them an email so that we can have a resource to share with folks, and then we'll close with prayer. So here's your last breakout room for break for uh, best practices. Uh, so that uh, pretty much concludes our session. Just a couple things to wrap up. Uh, first, thank you to Rory and Tim for being here and for helping us to lead this conversation and give us some great thoughts. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if you have ideas uh, that came up in your breakout session or things that you've been doing that you feel like work quite well, um, feel free to email those to Stephen at the hymnsociety.org. That's S-T-E-V-E-N at the hymnsociety.org. And he will curate all those and we'll put out a resource uh, using those ideas for the broader public to benefit from. And uh, finally, uh, does somebody out of, out of the 120 participants, is someone feeling particularly called to close us in prayer? Except for David Bjorlin. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Charlie, did you raise your hand? Or was that, or were you doing something else? No, I was moving. You were just moving. Yes. I'll go ahead, Brian. Thank you. I, I put a prayer up in the chat that I've used for years to introduce interim ministry when I come to a new congregation. 
And in my current setting, it fits very well with ministry in a, in a time of a pandemic. Let us pray. Oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Amen. Amen.